I would like to uh, introduce Brian Veloso. Uh, he works at, uh, at GitHub as a designer and has worked with Django for five years now. And he was going to talk about uh, designing your open source project. So please give Brian a warm welcome. It, it figures that the minute before I start presenting that my keynote remote would go. So I'm going to sit this here while Apple decides whether to grant me good luck or not and start. So first question, developers. I guess everybody should raise their hand for that. But designers, how many designers are in the room, self-professed designers? Half? Half a designer? If, if, you can, if you do any design, raise your hand. All right, how many people, how many of you have worked with designers before? How many people feel that as a pain point? All right, well, hopefully I can provide my insight on this, and Apple has given me some good luck here, so. So let's begin. This might be potentially abrasive and unforgiving. This is my opinion on the matter, but I have heard many stories about today's keynote, but I won't get into that. So the step one, the problem. You have an amazing open source project, but you need a designer. But the real problem is that designers are picky. Designers are stubborn. <laughs> designers have no time. Come on, Keynote. Designers are just like you. And I'll let that sink in <laughs> for a sec. But, but I know that. I know that feel, bro. And you know, let me let me exp let me explain myself. And I wanted to rock around, but that's not going to work out, is it? So first, it's, it's time to hug it out because we're going to be going through a little bit of a counseling session. Because really, we're quite similar. <laughs> uh, we're quite similar in many ways, and um, I've been doing um, this sort of analysis on designers and developers and the similarities between the two ever since I started getting into Django, and it's, it's really uh, stark how we only complain about different things, different subjects, but the way we work is exactly the same, so curing that misunderstanding between us is supposed, supposedly really easy. But the things that, um, that are similar with us, it's like we both, we all look for that produce, pursuit of per perfection. It's like that pixel perfection. I mean, I was working on these slides a little while ago, and I was comparing like the, this slide and that slide just to make sure that it lined up the same. As a designer, pixel perfection is my thing. As Python developers, as developers in general, making sure you follow Pep8, for instance, that's your, that's your perfection. That's your stylistic perfection. Respecting clarity. For designers, it's clarity through user interface. Um, example there being like the, the reader iOS app for iPad, being a really clear, very straightforward user interface. For Python developers especially, it's clarity through documentation, going into a Python project, knowing exactly what the hell you need, you need to do seeing that every method is, is documented and that you can go to read the docs and be able to understand the whole project without ever having to dive into code. That's something that, as a community, we're extremely proud of and something that you guys make very clear. Um, but also, we, we share this. We share this bickering for things. For designers, I had asked this on Twitter earlier because I had so many examples for designers. I couldn't come up with one. The designer's ability to get the code, for instance, is something that we bicker about a lot. And my stance, as an aside, is that designers should understand what the code does. I shouldn't have to ask to a designer to code in Python or to even write any JavaScript, JavaScript because personally, I don't know how. jQuery is JavaScript, right? Anyway. <laughs> but they should at least understand it. And that's the most I'd ask of any designer. And for developers, I, I figure I'd poke that, that sore spot. Also, just general misunderstandings. Like, you know, I've, I've seen many developers ask, uh, or many designers ask developers just, just make this work. I have this um, follower number that I want 
you to display, but the developer's like, well, it, it throws like 500 queries, and the designer's like, so. <laughs> and then my, one of my favorite arguments from developers to designers is the make it pretty argument. <laughs> Something I just, just want to make clear, you know, just reference this image every time you ask, or, or for designers, if you are asked to make something pretty, just reference this. This is what we do in our heads when this happens. Because it, obviously it's a lot more about making things pretty, and I really, I, I feel like in a sense I'm speaking to the choir, preaching to the choir because I, I've worked with a lot, of, a lot of you in the audience, I'm friends with a good amount of you, and um, you have a great understanding of what it means to, to be a designer, or be a developer, understand the language that we speak. So um, when I was going through this talk, and my, the, the title of my talk was pretty vague. Uh, I, I'm guessing, how many people here like, have an open source project on GitHub, obviously? Yes? Great. So I don't have to go into that. So we're going to get, get right into um, recruiting a designer. <laughs> and and, and it, it's not this. Unfortunately, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I wish I, I could I could use a few helping hands every now and then, but really, the the trouble I find with with Python projects in particular, I'm going to focus on that obviously, is that you have a lot. There's there's a bit of a, a timid feeling from developers when it comes to asking a designer because, like I was going um, through before, designers have no time. It's that nobody has any time. We're always, you know, it's that. It's that law that, you know, given any amount of time, you will use all of it. So obviously, we can always assume that nobody in this room has any time. But we do have a lot of passions, and there are things that we're passionate about. So what I'm going to go through is being able to sell your project to a designer. And the first step, and this is, if you, if you just want to be able to get out there, is putting your design requirements in your README. Design requir if your project requires any type of visual design, putting that in your README or your to-do or anything that that a designer can just come in and read on GitHub, because designers aren't afraid of GitHub anymore. Not like they have been like maybe a few years ago, but everybody uses sites like GitHub to be able to find projects. So make, it, make, your, make your requirements known and be explicit about it. Don't say, I need visual design. I need a pretty admin. Say, I need, like, I need JavaScript. I need a, you know, um, a designer with some JavaScript knowledge because we have a lot of behavioral items that we want to be able to um, want to be able to execute. Uh, so also find us on Dribble. As the screenshot is a search for open source on Dribble. There are designers out there who love to do open source work, and it's just a matter of finding those people and being and just going up to them, asking them if they'd be and pitching your project to them. Best place, in my opinion, is the hallway track of any conference. Not just a design conference, but any, like this conference here. Not me, obviously, I'm kind of busy. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the hallway track of, of any conference would be a great way to just pull a designer, uh, pull, a, yeah, pull a designer over and, ask, and pitch your project to them. And this has happened to me at past conferences many times, and I've been able to work on some amazing projects and just ama amazing ideas with other people just because they're like, hey, Brian, I have this idea for like a, you know, a packages repository that maybe we can work on, for instance. So really, just, just pitch it to us. And this is like an example pitch that I got from Mr. Kenneth Wright a few days ago. Um, so like, you know, am I super busy? Would I like to work on Python for humans? Like to and you know, I don't need to ask what Python for Humans is going to be, because I know Ken does great work, and I know he understands what I do, and the, we would have a really good relationship there together. So obviously, if you don't know the person very well, you have to introduce yourself and you know do all of that. Pitch how you would be pitching to a, a VC, or pitch how you'd be pitching to your co a co-founder if you're in that that sort of job. Yeah, have help if you have the time. Really simple site. I mean, obviously, I'd ask for more if I if I were to to accept this. Theoretically, um, so it's, it's a pretty good pitch, but uh, I, I, would, I would like I would like to say that this picture was taken by Kenneth Wrights. On top of that, but all I have to say is, we have a lot to be proud of in the Django community when it comes to design. So, 
I'm taking a little poke at, at Kenneth for saying that, but um, obviously we, we're, we're getting there with, uh, with design. You know, it doesn't have to be Ruby level design anymore. This is definitely Django level design. So to my fellow designers, and I guess, um, how many of you guys have worked in open source designers? So one, Tracy, you're not raising your hand, are you? You haven't worked in open source, okay. Well, this, I'm just gonna talk straight to you then. So, you know, open source is ex experiential. It's like open source gives you this, this warm, fuzzy feeling inside when you're working on it because it's not for any benefit, it's not for any, you're not working for money. And designers, like a lot of us, it's, it's, it's not so much a misconception that we, we design something for money. And whenever we design something as a labor of love, it's usually our personal sites. You know, something that will make us money in the future, but open source is not that. It's, it's truly a labor of love that will help everybody. And as Russ was talking about, being able to help the Django community, for instance, designing Django sites, going up to, you know, going up to PyDanny, for instance, and saying, hey, I want to help, you know, tweak Pyth uh, Django packages, uh, making it a bit more, a bit easier to navigate would be a huge payoff for you as a designer, not just in, and I think it's, it's, it's a long-lasting sort of, um, it's a long-lasting effect of being able to, or just having your name out there and then generating projects and then using those open source connections to be able to get, to get projects that will make you money. And I think it's crucial that people work on open source because you're not held by the same restrictions that you are with, say, a day job or a client project or something that, requ that has any requirement of time. You're not held so strictly to that. And you can play around with it. You can have fun with it. You can be experimental. And we don't have enough of that these days. And obviously, to make yourself known. So, uh, so hybrids is where I'd like to go with this next. And I'd like to call myself a hybrid. And mainly because I have two very scientific Venn diagrams to show you. That, that I like, I, I fit in the middle of this, um, well, not a lot. I mean, I, I would say that I, I kind of average out both. Because, I, because I've spent so much time in the, um, in the Python community over the past few years, I've actually started to, I started to eat away at the pieces that, like, I'm not really a big t typography anymore. You know, X heights don't, you know, arouse me at all. It's not, it's that, it's... <laughs> I mean, if I were at a designer conference, they'd be throwing tomatoes at me and getting, telling me to go off the stage, but this isn't one. Um, but also, it's this sense that you're in the middle of these two groups that are always fighting with each other, that, that don't understand each other. But when you're in the middle of it, and when you're able to do both, you're able, able to take a project by yourself from point A to point B, like from idea to deploying on Heroku or whatever, you have this understanding of the whole stack and you're able to communicate between, between designers and developers. And we're sort of those universal translators. We're those people, I can go, I can go to Tracy, for instance, and talk design, and then I can go to, to Kenneth or to, or to Marty, and, or Marty Alkin over there, and just talk development. So really what this is all coming down to is being able to have, to exchange knowledge. And this is my solution, time-consuming solution, unfortunately, to the problem of being able to uh, connect the worlds of design and development is for everybody to become hybrids, in a way. Like I was alluding to before when I was talking about um, the bickering bit and designers needing to know how to code. I would also like to see, and I saw a lot of hands go up, so I mean, it's, it's really awesome for me up here seeing that not knowing beforehand that a good amount of developers do design. So there's, an under, there's a basic understanding of what you like, of your, your stylistic views, and that when you talk to a designer, it'll be that much easier for you to be, to able, to be able to set the, set the bar for what they should be bringing back to you. So it's really about finding hybrids, finding, uh, and really more about, sorry, training hybrids. Finding somebody, finding a designer who has never programmed before. Finding out what that idea, that, that, the idea that's baking in their brain is, and helping them, pushing them off and building it 
starting their first Django project for them and helping them create that. Because that's really what it was for me. When I, five, five or so, maybe even was more than that, years ago, when I saw Jeff Croft talk about Django for the first time, it was a designer talking about a programming language. And I'm like, this is, this is nuts. Like, you on crack? Like, so I, I clicked in, and I asked him a few questions, sent him a few emails, and I was able to build my first project. And I felt, at the end of that project, I felt like I could do anything. Obviously, I couldn't because I wasn't quite there yet, but I felt like I could control the world in my hands because I was able to take this design and make it work. I built a, a site to track Wii Sports scores, and then the Wii kind of died, so, in Wii Sports for, so, but that's another story. So training people to be hybrids, in this sense, training designers to be able to code for themselves, to be able to take them forward. Tracy, over here, is, an amazing example of that. How, I mean, how long ago did you start Django? Was it just a year ago? A little, a little over a year ago, she started, she started learning Django. And her progression into Django, and her, just the tweets going by, I'm gonna embar completely embarrassing her, tweets going by about how much fun she was having being able to design and develop at the same time. I mean, more people need to do that. And you guys have the power to do that, because it's, not, it's easy for you. Django start project, or the, whatever way you start, the, whatever way you start a project is extremely easy for you, so it should be that much easier to be able to tell a designer, hey, I'm gonna take the time to teach you how to, to build this. And maybe in turn, they can teach you to do something, to be able to you know, get your line heights correct, or um, pick some nice typography, or be, be able to lay out CSS nicely, or lay out you know, pages in a nice manner, learn from them as well. And you know, pairing is, is, is a great way to do this. It's just if, if you're in a working situation where you're with a, with your, where you're with a designer or you're, working, you're constantly working with a designer and you have some 20% time, if your company allows you to do that, then, then pair with a designer and, and then uh, start teaching each other, encourage the knowledge exchange between the two. So yeah, help, help us replicate. Help everybody in this room becomes some kind of hybrid by you know, next year or the year after. And I think all of our jobs will be much easier. So working with designers, and since you all have worked with designers, it may be a rehash, um, but, but, it is, but it is a time investment. And um, it, you have to give you know, designers a lot, of, a lot of space to work. We don't like being micromanaged. We don't like our shoulders being looked over. It's like, ah, uh, that, that button should be blue. That, that layout is off. There. It's like, you know, we have, we have time. Uh, what, something I love to talk about when I'm talking design is happy accidents. Something's going completely wrong, or I delete a layer by accident. I, you know, I curse at Photoshop, and then, some, and then voila, something happens. I'm like, I'm going to go with this. So giving them the time and the space, and also restrictions and boundaries. Uh, and I'm getting into this a little a little bit later as well when I come when it comes to spec work. But restriction is good for for designers as well. It's like if if I'm going to tell you that we can only that Heroku can only run, you know, for instance, Redis, you're not going to go you know launching something in Cassandra. I don't know. I'm I'm saying this completely having not worked with Cassandra at all. So <laughs> maybe there's a there maybe there's a Heroku plugin for or add-on for Cassandra that I don't know. But it's being able to respect the, or provide and restrictions and boundaries and being able to respect those as well. Like being able to say, you know, I want a one, a one page site or this is our brand or, you know, things, things of that nature. And just death to spec work. Because spec work is pretty much the antithesis of everything I'm talking about here is going up and saying, hey, who wants a free t-shirt? Okay, just design my logo. I mean, being able to pro provide no, no sort of boundaries, there's no respect there. There's, you know, you're just having people fight for a cookie, you know, dogs fighting for a cookie and, you know, mauling each other in the process. It's, it's not, it doesn't create anything productive. It's, and it's not, it's not something that should be, that should be done. Of course. So getting to this point, as a developer, it takes time. And it, it, and it, takes, and it takes work, and it takes you being able to um, 
Actually, I had a good conversation yesterday with a, a few of the attendees uh, about, talk, about when it comes to talking to designers. And uh, we got into the conversation of talking to print. How many people have worked with former print designers, for instance? OK, a lot of people have worked. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not smacking print design. Well, I kind of am, but I'm not really. <laughs> Outright, no, because there is a, there's a sense of that with print designers that they're, that they're designing for print on the web and it just doesn't work. And I know they're hard to deal with. I've dealt with them myself. It's like I would be bald if I still, still worked with them. Uh, but it's about, it, there's even more, more of a time investment. And actually, there's, there's a lot more work that you have to do to well, let me put it this way. A good friend of mine has said that when you hire a designer, that you hire an expert in their field. When you hire a print designer, it's not necessarily that because they're, good, they're an expert at print. They're not an expert at web. So you're more of the expert in that sense, and you know what you need to look for. If, so when it comes to being it, if they present you a design, and you're like, this is how I design it. It looks like a freaking newspaper. Then ask them, is this usable? If I coded this for you, would you be able to use it? And if they said yes, you're working with the wrong designer, quite frankly. Don't be afraid to let people go because you're not doing anybody any favors. Bring them in. Teach them or just give them examples of what good usable design is and then have them study that. That doesn't require too much work on your part. It's just that you already know what sites you like to go to, even if that's you know, Hacker News. And you know, not, very, not a very designed site. But then it's, it's, it's just something for them to base around that doesn't look like something that was pulled out of a magazine. So where's Django in all of this? And uh, yeah, of course, there's something missing from my slide. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Dan. Daniel. Um, Django is special in this, <laughs> this sense. You can tell I had fun with this. Django fosters a community of, of respect, of shared purpose. <laughs> sorry. And obviously, they, they do all, they do, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you guys. Uh, <laughs> I, I did that at the last minute. It was like, OK. Anyway, I mean, the pony, for instance. like. There's a, there's, there's a great community around Django that's, that respects designers, and I almost feel like I should be giving this at like, you know, another con this, talk at a, this whole talk at another conference, because we have such great personalities. We have such, such great designers, developers that understand what it means to be able to work on a team, whether, you know, no matter how many designers or developers you have on that team. But it even goes farther than that in, the, in, in Django's case because of four words, and that's the benevolent designer for life. You know, Mr. Idan, Idan Gazet? Okay, Gazet? The fact that we have him, and the day he was put onto the team, I was so elated. It's like, finally. You talk about Ruby level design, yet you don't have anybody on the, you know, the core Rails team or on Ruby being able to say, we're, gonna, we're getting serious on design. Let's have somebody push that forward. And Idan does that for us. Whether that will be the future admin or future, you know, he's done so many sites for us already. So he's already setting the bar for what design in Django can be. And we should take advantage of that and drive it, and drive it forward because design matters to Django. So designers should matter to you. And that's, again, preaching to the choir. So <laughs> here's your moment of zen, completely devoid of memes or, well, not really, but white space or color. <laughs> so obviously, this could have been a little heavy-handed. This is the opinion of one designer, and your mileage may vary. But as I was talking to the, um, the pair of people I was talking to last night, distill it where needed. You know. Uh, Everybody has different situations that they're put in when they're working with designers. And I, I encourage you, I wish this could have been a full Q&A, but I encourage you to approach the microphone if you have a specific case where you're working with a designer and, and have trouble with that, 
or a designer working with a developer. You know, it can be either way, either case. And you know, being able to being able to talk about that edge case with a print designer, for instance, you know, added not only added to my talk, but it made me aware that that, <laughs> that unfortunately still exists. But I think the question we need to we need to go forward with is how do we perpetuate this feeling? How do we perpetuate this, the good relationships that we have between designers and developers? How do we perpetuate good design in Django? And Idan is a good start. And the fact that I saw so many hands raised is a great start. But if, if I were to go in that room, for instance, would I have the same effect? I mean, you guys came to this talk because you're interested in hearing about this, not necessarily the Postgres SQL, Postgres talk. So there'd maybe a, be a different cross-section of people there, but we need to perpetuate it to them in this case. And be able to have them be able to respect the, the working relationship between a designer and developer. So you know, your users in the end <laughs> will puke rainbows all over your project and everybody will be able to use your project because you, you have an amazing landing site or you have an, a, an amazing plugin for the Django admin that makes the Django admin extremely pretty. Grappelli, for instance. Like how many people use Grappelli? The, the extension of the Django admin, not enough people. I mean, granted, there are probably some. I saw some dissents out there, but like, I mean, being able to recreate experiences or heighten or depend, depending on how you feel about it or not, the, the experience of working with Django, you know, we can, we can push that forward. And together we can make the web not so bad. <laughs> so, um, if we still have time before questions, uh, my introduction. Hi, I'm Brian. Um, a designer developer hybrid. Um, I help maintain Django Image Kit. So, um, where's Matthew? Is he, is he in here? Hey, with Matthew Treader over there. We, we do Django Image Kit. I mostly do documentation. He does most of the grunt work because he's awesome. <laughs> and uh, I am the father of the Django pony. I'm glad, I'm glad I'm getting clapping. And uh, David Kramer isn't in here, is he? OK, good. <laughs> that come at me bro picture that I showed you before, that was to him when we were talking about the Django pony. Anyway, I'm really proud of, I mean, I haven't been, unfortunately, I haven't been to a Django con since Cal Hendrickson talked and inspired me to bring this here. But the, the way you guys have taken it, I've, farther than I, I would have. <laughs> Not in a bad way, but in like in like ways that I couldn't imagine. And it's been great to see how it would connect the community, uh, even though half of the BDFLs don't approve of it so much. Uh, obviously, I work at GitHub as a designer. Um, yes, that is a recent picture of how big we are. No, we were at one one fourteen. Yeah, and my info. Um, I am on GitHub, Facebook, Twitter, and if you do watch. Um, if you're into gaming at all, if I may, uh, I do shout cast, as they call it, StarCraft II and, and Dota matches on there. So uh, with that, if I'll take any questions. And otherwise, uh, thank you for uh, thank you for your time. Thank well, you, uh, first of all. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, we should all try to become hybrids, and you mentioned designers becoming more developers. It seems like that might be easier because that's kind of well documented, and you know it's a little more cut and dry sometimes. Do you have any resources or tips for developers who might want to be more on the designer side? Places we can go to learn that kind of thing, or do we just talk to people like you? Unfortunately, that um, I could point you to so many places. Like, I, it's easier to search on Google for how to become a. I would, I would guess so. Like, the, the the Google results for designer to developer are less polluted than developer to designer because then you just get Photoshop tutorials all over the place of how to make a button you'll never use. Um, I would. I have a talk on this. I have a YouTube channel. Um, I'm trying to do vlogging, and I have an episode where I talk about replication. And really, to become a good designer is to, be, is to learn by doing. It's to take a site that, or an element, anything, that intrigues you, that you would like to use, and being able to learn how that works. And replicating that, and replicating it to the point that it exactly matches what you're trying to, that's replication, obviously. 
because uh, I've taught many workshops in which pe I've asked people to replicate, and they give me, like, I've given them a gray button, and they give me a blue button. It's like, why is it blue? I asked you to replicate it. Then after that, after you're done with that, then you can make it your own, and then add that to your repertoire. So that, that's really the best way, I can say, the most foolproof way to do that. Um, so thanks for the idea of uh, looking at Dribble. although um, it strikes me that uh, that site seems like for designers by designers just sharing with each other for feedback. And so going in and saying, hey, I like your pretty, uh, can, can you share, you know, maybe might take, be taken the wrong way. Is there any way to uh, tell if people are open to, you know, uh, that kind of approach? Um, it's, it's really hard, unfortunately, and even like, I don't know if for any of the other designers in the room, Dribble has become a very intimidating place, even for people that have been in the industry for a long time, because the stylistic nature of Dribble has drifted towards extreme skeuomorphism. So really, it's just, when I talk replication, it's like you never publish any of that. It's all, it's all for learning. And if you're going to contact somebody on Dribble, I mean, you're, you're not going to have to interact with them on the site. You know, it's just find, I, I really wish it were easier, and I had this idea way back when that I, I know, after hearing Russ talk, I really should get on to. It's called, like, it was called the Pony Corral, where I would pair designers with developers who have designers who have, or just people, on the, designers who have an interest in working in open source, putting their name out there, and uh, hopefully um, getting some attention that way, if that answered your question at all. All right. Yeah, I have one more, um, okay. which is, uh, I am a developer, I don't identify as a designer, but I have a lot of interest in design. Uh, I haven't developed that skill, but I would think that that would be appealing to work with designers. In other words, maybe they have ideas and we would be a team together or you know that sort of thing. That's there, exactly what I was going yeah. with, towards with the knowledge exchange. It's, I mean, Marty, good friend of mine, loves data design, for instance. So I would, if I ever had time, I'd you know, love to help you, you know, develop that at all, but I, th I think it's, it's, it's just really important to be able to pair up because obviously it just, it'll just work, it'll, that knowledge exchange will just happen. And then you can just you know, tell that designer what you're interested in, and maybe you'll just pique even more interest that way and they'll be able to help you understand what, you're, you know, what your interests are and bring you to a higher level of understanding there. Uh, so as a developer with like sort of less than stellar design skills, I find that uh, not having those skills is sort of a terribly convenient excuse to either not finish projects or like actually as a touch point to like collaborate with someone else at that point when I need design. But mm -hmm. as a hybrid, do you find that there's more pressure on yourself to sort of take something solely through the whole process? And, and at what point do you decide when it's time to bring in another person to help you, on, uh, help you out? That's a great question because I have a pro project I've been working on for four years that is sorely in need of, wait for it, design help. <laughs> because I've been coding it for so long, I've written this system like and rewritten it about four times, once a year, I guess. But um, it gets to that point when you hit, when a great entrepreneurial sort of an analog that I can provide is that um, actually my wedding DJ had told me that what you do at the end of a year is that you list all of your, all of the things you do. You highlight all of the things you love to do, and then you hire for all of the things you don't want, that, you, that aren't highlighted. So to answer your question, I, I find myself at that point, it's like when, when I can't, when it becomes too much of, when it becomes a pressure point, I will look for somebody. Because I could be doing someone, something else that I like, and not that, if that answers your question at all. All right, awesome. So uh, you mentioned you don't want the just make this pretty, and, but you also mentioned you don't want spec work and you, don't, you want that freedom. When you were initializing that conversation with a designer, whether it be an open source or say you're working with a, some sort of client, how would you recommend the de a developer open that conversation if they're not they don't trust their own design skills and they all they really want is to make it pretty but they also don't they want to give you enough guidance that you can go through without being overly controlling you can save each other a hell of a lot of time if you just talk like really because uh, i think a lot of developers and actually just designers when i'm asking questions on stack overflow i i pain myself over exactly what i should say to get the question answered but it's the same thing for it's the same thing for designers as a designer any good designer will drill you on the exact specifications for that specific project. And 
it'll be a lot easier if you kind of think to yourselves, like pro providing very soft like examples, providing examples of what you'd like to see. Um, but I say soft because a lot of clients I've worked with provided hard examples, and they're like, why doesn't it look like that? Because I'm not a freaking stealer. That's why it doesn't look like that. So being able to just, just communicate, like, this is, this is how I feel. I feel is not bad in a conversation with a designer. It's like, I feel like this should be this way. I feel like this, you know, that, the color, that this color scheme should be you know, purple and red. It's up to the designer to then come back to you and say, you know, you're, you're wrong, or you know, maybe we can work with that. And, but just being able to get it out there provides something for the designer to work with. And yeah. So. Thank you. Since I'm the last one, and since we have a designer on stage, can you, um, and because your slides are probably the most beautiful slides I've seen uh, so far this week, um, this week uh, could you walk us through something silly, but like more practical, like how did you choose that typeface, just for, for example? It just felt right. It, it's really, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it does feel good. I mean, like, I'm very, unfortunately, like, I, I don't subscribe to, I'm not classically trained in design. I went to school for business. I got into this and learned everything by myself because I had, you know, because that's what I wanted to do. I have this chip on my shoulder that I don't like being taught my hobby by other people. So that, that led me to these sort of nebulous ideas and like of being able to look at a font and say, well, this is the type of presentation I'm doing. So maybe it should be something a little bit more, you know, techy or techy or futuristic or something like that. You know, I didn't want to put Gotham up there, for example, because I felt it was a bit overused in my slides because I've used it a lot in the past. So I kind of what I do is just go through for typefaces, for example, I just download typefaces, free typefaces a lot. And, you know, I'll turn then, but I'll keep them off. And when I when I go to a, uh, to make my presentation, I'll turn a bunch on just by feel. And then I'll, I'll just go with that, for instance. Um, a lot of these things, like this is a similar design to my PyCon Philippines talk, uh, mainly because it just came by, it came by accident, the happy accidents mm -hmm. I was talking about. I was just playing with different things until, I, until, it, just, until it felt right. And it, that really, unfortunately, doesn't really help you at all. But you like, you like good, everyone, everybody in this room has an eye for design. You know what you like because you purchase those things. So it's just a matter of shifting that focus onto that screen and saying, this feels right. And just playing with it until it's like, yeah, that's, this feels right, and I can go forward with it. And if other things change, if the requirements change, then your feelings will change, and you just keep changing along with it. All right. Okay. All right.